presentation can be heard by everyone. Could I please ask you to keep your microphones um, on mute throughout the session? There is time for um, questions and feedback at the end of the presentation. Um, you can also use the chat function at the top of the screen if you want to type something in during. Um, and also you can raise your hand with the little hand signal at the top of your screens. Um, in the spirit of our sessions, um, obviously everybody's view is important to us. Feel free to say what you think. There is no right or wrong answers. And um, whatever you've got to say, we, we like to build on those ideas that come through from these sessions. So please feel free to ask anything. So our guest speakers today are Joe White and Kathy Hopkins and Nicholas Greenhill from Co-op Futures. So without further ado, I will pass over to Joe and Kathy to get us underway. Hello, um, thank you for, for coming this evening. Um, as Karen's already said, Kathy and I are from uh, Co-op Futures um, and I'll explain a little bit about us in a moment. And we're really grateful to Nick, who's here from Co-op Web, who's um, a worker co-op, who's come to tell us about his ex uh, his experiences. Um, just very briefly, Co-op Futures has um, supports uh, new existing co-ops to grow and to set themselves up. Um, and we've been around for the last 20 years. And we've been very fortunate in our relationship originally with the Oxford, Swindon and Gloucester Co-op and now obviously mid counties um, and they actually sort of initiated Co-op Futures um, to work with them. Um, and we've been very fortunate about that ongoing relationship um, and the support that they pro provide for us. So I'm just going to um, do a quick presentation about worker co-ops um, and uh, hopefully it will segue seamlessly into uh, Kathy and Nick talking a little bit more about, about Nick's co-op. So I'm hoping you can see the presentation. Excellent. So um, just a a quick reminder, because you can never say it too often, just a quick run through of the um, seven principles of, of cooperation. Um, open and voluntary membership, democratic member control, cooperation amongst cooperatives, autonomy and independence, member economic participation, concern for the community and education. And the ones where we look at worker co-ops, there are a couple there that are really um, important. Firstly is the democratic member control um, and the other one is around member economic participation and you'll see why those two are really the ones that, or, or, although all cooperatives adhere to, to the full set of seven principles, in different types of cooperatives we find that some are uh, I would say greater, but none of them are greater, are, are, are more prevalent than perhaps the others are. So um, first off, what is a worker co-op? Well, firstly, they're trading enterprises and they're actually owned and run by the people who work in them. So that means that they have control over how that business runs and that they are able to take um, an equitable share of the wealth that is created by those co-ops. So instead of it disappearing off into anonymous shareholders or um, big corporations elsewhere, the, the, the wealth that is generated through worker co-ops is locked in to those particular members and they have um, self-determination really over how their co-op runs. So just because you can never do a co-op meeting without mentioning the Rochdale pioneers at least once, um, this is my reference to them. So in 1844, object five, because obviously the principles have changed over time, that they said as soon as is practicable to proceed to arrange the powers of production, distribution, education and government, or in other words, to establish a self-supporting colony of interests. And you can see from that the issues around production are there. 
So the original work co-ops were actually what were described as productive societies. And there are some that you can see on the screen here, um, the Sheffield cutlery being one, so um, that they were makers of uh, cutlery um, and sold as a cooperative owned and run by the workers. And the one on, on the left is um, Doc Martins. I don't know how many people here owned a pair of Doc Martins in their life, but I certainly have had several. Um, and so the Northamptonshire Productive Society was the shoemakers um, that owned the Doc Martin brand. And they were originally established in 1881. Um, so the concept of worker co-ops is not new. Um, it has been around for, for you know, a long, long time now and was certainly at the heart of the ideas that the Rochdale pioneers came up with that was you know that ownership of of employment was always there at the heart of what they were trying to achieve so since those 19th century um productive societies there have almost been sort of several waves of worker co-ops since then um the second wave were worker co-ops that came about in the 1970s um, and some of them will be very familiar to people. Um, since then we've almost had a third wave so after that sort of setting up in the in the 1970s um, things there were there were a, a, a lot of worker co-ops around in the in, in the 1980s but then they started to reduce and diminish the number of worker co-ops but then around the sort of 2008 2010 time actually we started to see another wave uh, where the number of worker co-ops started to increase and since then we've started to see slightly different forms of worker co-ops where um, there are either mixed a membership of workers or they are actually co-ops of self-employed people and I'll show you some more examples of those in a minute. So um, in terms of that second wave, those sort of 1970s um, worker co-ops, uh, Essential Trading was set up in 1971. Essential is one of the um, biggest whole food um, distributors in the UK. I'm sure most people have also heard of Suma, which is the biggest whole food distributor in the UK, who is also a worker co-op set up around the, about that similar sort of time. And certainly in the whole food sector, worker co-ops um, have been at the forefront, really, of those types of businesses. Um, another one um, is uh, the New Internationalist. The New Internationalist is um, a magazine that really has taken on uh, issues and campaigns from across the world and they are owned by their writers and their contributors and um, they all partake in, in how the business is run and um, they are based in Oxford um, and as I say, have been around since 1973. Um, then we move on to sort of the more uh, recent generation of, of worker co-ops. And you'll notice that these have now moved on from um, where we have the productive societies. They were very, very much about making things. Then you, we moved on to sort of the second wave, which was really around um, the, whole foods and distribution and um, there, there were quite often um, marketing co-ops again were set up around that time and then in the third wave you can see how society has changed um, most of these are based around IT um, or media and um, there's there's certainly sort of a change in, in, in how worker co-ops manage to a, a, adapt to the particular sectors that are coming along at the time. Outlandish, um, I know Nick can tell you more about Outlandish than I can, but um, they are an IT co-op that was set up in 2014 based in London. Um, another one set up around a similar time was Blake House. They are uh, filmmakers and they've done sort of lots of work for um, third sector charity NGO companies um, 
So they very much look that their customer is it has an ethical base to it, and they're able to make those decisions um, because they own the company, and therefore they're not just required to drive profit. They run a business that chimes with their ethos. As I say, as we've seen the adaption from making things to more service co-ops through to those based in IT, we're also starting to see now a change in quite how the worker co-ops are starting to look. And um, the Equal Care Co-op is a co-op around um, supporting care, uh, some domiciliary care, some sort of community care. Um, but the, where the business, the care business, is actually owned both by the workers and those who receive care. Um, and both of those groups of people can become members of that particular co-op. And it's about recognising um, the importance of that business to, to both of those groups of people, particularly around care, where it's really important that um, it's, it's a business that is very, very much people focused. Um, and another one that we're starting to see is where you have both worker and community members. Um, and one of these is Kitty's Laundrette based in Liverpool. Um, there's a great backstory to this. Kitty was um, in the when TB was particularly prevalent. Um, she was she took in laundry for people who didn't have access to washing facilities and helped kind of combat the the um, the, the TB infection in that way. And they've taken her story and they've created a laundrette and it is a laundrette, but it also has community spaces and offers lots of community activities and facilities that are focused around the building. And again, it's how the worker co-op model has adopted to um, changing circumstances and the needs of society and their communities. So um, another type we're starting to see is where self-employed people are coming together to create co-ops, not technically worker co-ops, but they enable the same type of economic participation that, that those who have paid um, employed workers have. Recall is a group of self-employed translators and um, based in London and they again have that opportunity to access bigger contracts because they've come together in in these this cooperative. Um, so as you can see you know worker co-ops although they were sort of identified in the 1844-1840s they have managed to adapt and change to to keep up with times. So just to say, they're not just in the UK, um, they are a, a global movement um, and SICOPA is the international organisation of what are known as industrial and service cooperatives. So you can see how they actually define um, what we would consider to be a worker co-op. And then just finally, the World Declaration on Worker Cooperatives, creating and maintaining sustainable jobs and generating wealth in order to improve the quality of life of the worker members, dignify human work, allow workers democratic self-management and to promote community and local development. And I think that really um, encapsulates what a worker co-op is about. Um, and so that really is just a quick rattle through um, the sort of the, the, a little bit of background and knowledge on what a worker co-op is. I hope that hasn't been too too much of a rattle through. So at this point, my having given you the theory, I'm going to hand over to Kathy and Nick to um, talk about what it's like in real life. Thanks, Thanks very, very much, much. Jo. Um, um, so, so yes, yes, I'm just going to have a conversation with Nick. So as um, Jo said earlier, Nick, um, is a member of a worker co-op, co-op web. Um, so we're just going to have a bit of a conversation and just find out a bit more about um, what what that means for, for Nick and his job. So um, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself, um, your role at co-op web and what a typical day might look like for you, Nick? Yeah, so co-op web, we are a very geeky web development um, IT company based in Birmingham. What that means is, because we're a worker co-op, 
pretty much everyone that joins us is a hardcore geek that loves to develop and loves to write websites and really get down in the details. I am not one of those people. I actually find that quite dull and boring. So what that means is I end up doing everything else. So we've fallen into a kind of a 90-10 split at Cartweb where 90% of the people do very geeky things and do cool things on computers. Then the rest of us pick up everything else that means running a business. So what this actually means is in my role, I get a lot more exposure to every side of the business than I would in, an, in a traditional organization. Whereas Cartweb took me on very much as an account slash project manager. If I was in a normal kind of, well, I say normal, if I was in a, a standard traditional kind of business, I'd be very much pigeonholed in that role. But because of us being a worker cop, it's actually allowed me to branch out and get involved in every, every aspect, whether that be sales, accounts, um, mm -hmm. all the finances, anything and everything I basically want to. So it, it's really good at, at shining a spotlight on how we're different from just your bog standard agency down the road. OK, great. Um, so how long has Co-op Web been going for um, and and what was the initial traction of setting it up as a worker cooperative rather than any other model? OK, um, so this is kind of McCounty's fault. Um, <laughs> so we actually have quite a long history that predates our current structure as Cooperative Web. Mm -hmm. The founders of Cooperative Web actually started at an IT company called Pandanet back in 1999. Um, where they happily worked until 2003 when they became part of Mid Counties Co op. Um, then, for just over three years, um, they worked as just a development team in Mid Counties Co op before Mid Counties gave us the opportunity to, to kind of go out and set up our own organization. Mm -hmm. At that point, we'd obviously had a lot of exposure to co ops through Mid Counties, and we felt that a worker co op really fitted what kind of organization we were going to be. Because obviously, there was lots of, you know, we, we already decided we wanted to be a co op, and there was lots of different options for us at that point. But we felt with how we wanted to kind of grow and expand, a worker co op really kind of ticked all the boxes. It was actually sold to me by, if any of you know our colleague Ed Russell, um, the way he sold me the worker cart was when he gets his Lamborghini, we all do, at which point there was no reason to really say no. And over the last 15 years, we've just kind of grown from there. OK, brilliant. And it all grown to the point where you've got Lamborghinis? Not quite. Not quite yet. <laughs> We're on VW, so we're getting there. Um, so I think there are about 17 or 18 workers at Co-op Web. Um, so how, the, the reality of it, how do you sort of manage that decision making within a team of, of that many people? So we, we basically delegation of responsibilities and trust. Um, so we've actually chopped and changed quite a lot over our 15 years, but we've settled in a really nice process about seven, eight years ago. We decided that we had a lot of mixture of different kind of members, some who, some who really relish taking on decisions and, and being in those stressful positions, others that really didn't want to. But the one thing we found is that everyone wanted to understand those decisions and what was happening. So we actually voted in a, a more of a traditional management structure to, to manage the day-to-day -day decisions and responsibilities, but with the understanding that they'll be completely open and transparent. So we then hold um, by... Um, so every two months we hold members meetings where we basically run through all the decisions we've made, any significant decisions, obviously not the, the smaller details. And then we kind of, we we help, we we work in a way that we can explain it to all the members so they can understand it. Because if we've got to that point, then it means we've been able to rationalise and make a good decision. And we find that really helps with the trust. And it's not just on one person. So whereas I said earlier about how I really enjoy the whole business side of things and the finances, the members have decided to to delegate the finances to me, but things like purchasing our hardware, they've delegated to a completely different person because that's their kind of expertise. Likewise with our licensing, likewise with our training, different members of the co-op have all kind of stepped up and taken different parts of responsibility. So it's shared between the people that want to do it while also just giving constant feedback and reassurance to the members that we're doing the right thing for them. So no one person can just run away and make a, a crazy decision. Right. So it's delegation of responsibility, but still with that transparency. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, are there any challenges about being a worker co-op? Uh, yeah, absolutely. 
So again, we've been going for 15 years, so we've had lots of challenges uh, along the way. One of the biggest challenges that we just weren't really prepared for were, were people not really being interested in the co-op. Sometimes that doesn't matter. Sometimes they're happy just to kind of come along on the journey and trust you. Other times where we've made mistakes with recruitment, it has actually been quite disruptive. And we've really had to focus on that when we when we bring people into the membership, we have to focus as much on the person and their ideals as much as their technology and what they can bring from from a sales perspective. So I think it's just realizing that, you know, people do have more of an impact on your business. It's not just a, oh, they're good at their job, we'll kind of put up with them so they they deliver or, oh, they're no good at their job, let's get rid of them. It's very much a how you kind of create that community within your business while still being successful and obviously bringing in the money because if you don't bring in the money, then the co-op's no more. So it, it is a balancing act and something that we've, that is a challenge, but one that that's worth it if you get it right. Yeah, definitely. Um, so is there any advice you can give to um other people who are maybe looking at this model for for either tech company or for for something else any sort of advice for other wannabe worker co-ops um i mean it's a great thing to do i would say there's no template structure so the thing i touched on earlier it was very important for us to find our way for a number of years of how best to run ourselves mm -hmm. but how we run ourselves isn't going to be best for another worker co-op every worker co-op is going to be completely different um, some people have completely flat structures. Some people use these new fancy methodologies that work really well for them. Other people just literally run as a business. It's very much finding what works for you and your members, and understand that's probably going to change as you get bigger. When mm -hmm. there was just when there was just five of us, we very we were very much a flat structure, and that was really easy. As we hit the twelve thirteen mark, we then had to 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 change, and that's okay. And again, just you know make sure you're bringing in people that have the same kind of ethics as you the ideology and, and want the business to succeed yeah great thanks very much um and then a uh, pandemic related question so i understand you've or you've gone shifted to remote working rather than all being in an office together has that impacted how you operate or how you communicate with each other um how has that sort of fared yeah, I mean, we're also very lucky. We are we are an IT company, so we're already we're always set up to be able to be fully remote. It was mm -hmm. part of our business continuity plan. It's easy for me to say. So we we kind of had it in our in our head that we'd have to work remote in situations. So from a practical point of view, it it kind of worked okay initially. What we found is is we found that actually it was detrimental for membership engagement. One of the strengths we had was that every two months we had membership meetings that were in the office. We could have open and honest discussions and chat through. We find doing them remotely, it's much harder for people to to engage, especially if there's a contentious issue. When we're all in the office together, we felt we made a very safe, safe environment for people to to be open and honest. People are finding it much harder on, on Teams. Um, we don't know why. We actually thought it'd be easier for people, but it's not. So that's something we're currently trying to overcome and seeing how we can encourage people to to still have that engagement because actually if we start to lose that engagement that's really what defines us as a worker co-op yeah okay brilliant thanks very much um and then um my last question before we sort of open the floor to, to questions from anyone else um where do you go for support um lots of different places but actually two of the main places are co-op futures and mid counties um so obviously we have a very good relationship with co-op futures they've supported us a lot in the past i don't think we'd be where we are without without your help uh, in a number of of places but also we'd still have a lot of friends and colleagues at mid counties so as i say we did we did spin out of mid counties 15 years ago and there's still that support network there if we need it so it, it's nice to have that and as the co-op movement grows especially in the tech industry we find more tech co-ops starting up that also as we offer them support they can offer us support back and i think that's something that's really nice it's not it doesn't feel cutthroat we we actually i mean joe mentioned about outlandish earlier we work with them quite closely we talk to them quite closely so if we hit hurdles 
we have no issues calling them and asking them for help, support, resources, and vice versa. So very much reciprocal cooperation yeah. rather than competition. 100%, yeah. Brilliant. Um, thanks very much. So hopefully that's given people a bit of an insight into into the realities of, of what uh, work co-op um, looks like and the sort of day-to-day -day running of the business. Um, so at this point, I'm going to see if anybody's got any questions either for me and Joe at Co-op Futures or for Nick. Oh, we've got a couple of hands up. Shall I go for Karen first? Yeah. Um, how many members have you got at the moment, Nick? So we've got 18 members, uh, 19 employees or workers. Um, we never know what the correct term is for people that aren't quite the members yet. Yeah. Uh, so 19 in total. And that's because we've just taken on someone last month and we have a six month probation and 18 members. OK, and just another one. Um, you said you've got about 17, 18 employees. Are you looking to increase, grow on your uh, workforce or are you happy with the amount of people you've got in your workforce at the moment or are you looking to expand sort of thing? Uh, we are looking to expand, um, but we're looking to expand cautiously. So in the past, we did make the mistake of expanding too quickly. We we had basically rushed from 20 members to 30 in the space of a year because the demand for work was there. And that's really where we made the mistake about the people we kind of got to join the co-op and actually they weren't quite the right fit for our for our environment. So we are looking to expand and we would like to go back up to that number, but much more long term. Right. Thank you. I think Rebecca, you had a question that you wanted to ask as well. Yeah, thanks very much for that information as well. Nick is really interesting. Can I just ask a quick question? Um, what's your vision for the next kind of three to five years with Cult Web? Um so it depends whether you want me to get really diggy and technical or like a bit more kind of fluffy. Um, so we have a very strong strategy and vision that's put in place by the board because of the way that our industry is shifting. The key thing for us is to keep a good solid structure for the members we've got. So we are going to have to change the way we work. There's no doubt about that. We want to make sure that we keep the members we've got and we train them and keep them engaged with us rather than them feeling that they need to move on and leave the co-op and just bring new people in. So it kind of, it goes hand in hand. It's, it's a bit weird, but yeah, it's a, a shift in the seas, I guess. Thank you. Um, we've got a hand up from Ed as well. Did you want to ask your question, Ed? Hello, Ed. Did you want to type it, Ed, if your microphone's not working? Yeah, we can't hear you, Ed. Are there any other? Oh, here oh, we go. Oh. oh, we've got a question from Christopher. Ed, while we're doing this question, if um, if your microphone's not working, if you want to chat, if you want to type in the chat bubble um, your question, and we can get that answered for you. Yeah. So looking at uh, Christopher, a really good question. So he's asked, given the need for people to fit in with a worker cooperative, do you have an assessing and interviewing process more complex than what we usually expect at job interviews? Not really. Um, it's just I think it's we focus on different things. So we wouldn't, I think actually we're, we're probably a bit easier than most. If you go to a tech company, they've probably got a massive exam you have to do and loads of random questions and stuff about logic and light switches and loads of really, I won't use the word because I'm being recorded, um, but everyone thinks they Google these days and it's just infuriating. We we really try and focus more on the person, make the interview a bit more personal, get to know them and how they'll fit in and actually with our interviews, like of anything, we were 100% transparent about ourselves. So we talk about any issues we're facing as an organisation. We talk about why we want that person to come and help with those issues. So I think we differ and I think it's better from both sides. Um, but certainly I wouldn't say more complex or difficult. Great, great question. Um, 
Uh, we have, don't seem to have got anything from Ed yet. So, um, Ed, what I'll do is I'll put my email address in the chat here for you. And if you want to email me your question later on, I'll pass it on to the guys and get a um, and get an answer for you and then email you back if that's OK. If we because we just it doesn't seem like your microphone's working. Oh, here we go. He's typed. What, there we go. Sorry, audio problems. There you go. OK, brilliant. I'll just um, just to tackle Chris's first because he's just sent a, qu a quick follow up question. Um, so he's asked if there's an interim of a probationary period. Yes, we give a six month probationary period. That's really important. We because we don't want people coming in and being members from day one just in case because you can never tell from an interview. So we want to make it sure sure it's right for us and them. Um, so Ed asked if we're constituted as a co-op society or a limited company. So we're set up as a limited company purely because of the difficulties back in. We set up back in 2006 where it was a bit more difficult um, in the day than it is now to set up as a as a co-op. I'm pretty sure the only reason we weren't a co-op is we literally didn't have enough people to meet the threshold to be a co-op at the time. When, which when I think you is were lowered. Yeah, when you were set up, uh, you needed seven members and you were only five um, yeah. to, to become a society. Now that's been reduced down to three. So um, so that's why you ended up with what you are. Yes. Lovely, some great questions there. Thanks very much. Has anybody else got any questions um, for Nick? Okie doke. So um, we've rattled through that quite quickly, um, but that's fine. We've all got our, our evenings to, to get on with. Um, so I think if there aren't any other questions, either for me or Joe or Nick, then I'll pass back to Karen at this point. OK, lovely. Thanks, Cathy. That was great. Thanks ever so much, um, Nick, for, for joining us and um, obviously Joe, um, the, the, the slides at the beginning. Um, I note. Oh, we had someone, uh, a late joiner, Claire, join us. Um, Claire, if you are still there, just to let you know, we have recorded this session, which you will be able to find on our website. Um, so you'll be able to see that. And if once you've viewed it, if you have any questions and that, again, you can email myself. Um, I'll just put my email address in the chat and I can pass on your questions to the guys and then get back to you. Um, so let me just pop that in before we finish. I'm not the fastest typer in the world, but there you go. So there's my email address. Oh, Chris has got another question for you. I don't know who wants to, I don't know who wants to answer that one. I have to confess that this time in the evening I've forgotten what the Morocco rule law is. So um, if you're able to add a little more detail to that, that'd be helpful. Chris, does your microphone work? Are you able to ask the question? Hello. Hi, Christopher. Hello. Hi, everybody. Firstly, my apologies, but the, the, you know, you might think I, I, I'm, I, it's such a shame I couldn't join right at the start. So my little explanation, I've, I've come off another Zoom meeting with the PEF, the Progressive Economy uh, Forum, very, very progressive economists, and they were actually discussing the direction of Brexit. So, you know, I was trying to, to, to do two things at once and can't do everything. Um, therefore, I, I, I do apologise for missing this. And I'm at least my thanks and appreciation to Mid Counties and to Cooperatives Futures for sort of putting this sort of an event on. Ever so interesting. I was at the last one when you were talking about um, was it Wolvercote and, and those sort of uh, uh, those three uh, ventures all progressing. So yeah, I, I take a genuine interest in all this. Um, Macora Law is something that has uh, developed in Italy. It's in essence a way of empowering the workers. Uh, to take over a business when uh, when the boss of the business or bosses or a family or whatever it is, they want to depart, they want to retire, they want to sell it. 
And so there becomes a, a question of, right, so the business sort of still exists. What are we going to do with it? Within Italy, they've now got two things, if I get, get it right. One is that there is a, at least a first opportunity for the staff, the employees, to say, could we do a buyout and, and turn it into a cooperative, a, a workers' cooperative? And then the second point is because Italy genuinely supports this in and not just in words and even bare legislation, there is a fund that exists because obviously the workers wouldn't have the money necessarily to buy the business out. So it, it's a fantastic uh, tool that's been there in legislation in Italy and it, it won't affect all your circumstances by any means because you are either cooperatives or in Nick's case then uh, sort of a cooperative or meaning to be thereof but you know that's the interesting just with the legislation just listening to what you said right at the end there and so I just wonder what your view might be because you, you know and you said you work with others when it comes to the tech and other cooperatives so I just wonder there will be cooperatives or groups coming along saying we want to do this but we don't know how to do it and one of the things might be that there be a workers' buyout, and that's a heck of an opportunity if we can get a Macora law. So I'm trying to share this with everybody because we need to be, you and I, we all need to be the ones pushing it. But I just wonder, you know, if you're saying, oh, gosh, that would have been ever so interesting to us or useful to us. So I do wonder how you sort of feel about it, and therefore hopefully you might support it. I know the Cooperative Party, along with Labour, are trying to push for that uh, in Parliament. So, you know, any observations or comments on that sort of possibility within legislation? There we go. Nick, do you want to go first on that? Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously anything that could help support the movement is brilliant. If, you know, if there could be a fund where people could could um, access capital to buy out, I think fantastic. We, I mean, I, I have to admit, we do push the agenda of co-ops whenever we talk to other IT companies in a similar position. I recently tried to convince the Manchester agency to go that way. In the end, they ended up closing down and we just took all their members and clients anyway and made them part of our co-op. Um, and I'm currently talking to another company in Bath where I'm really trying to encourage them to go the co-op way with their founders moving back to America. So I think it's a good thing. I think growing the co-op industry can only be good because again, as I said, we work with other tech co-ops, whereas if they weren't tech co-ops, I don't think we'd be working with them. We we certainly wouldn't be passing work in the way we do. We we trust that if we pass them work, they're not going to steal our clients because there's that kind of trust and, and friendship there. So it, the more people we can get on that kind of level, I think is really good. Whether it comes to fruition, I guess would be another thing, but the same for anything, isn't it? Thanks, Nick. I mean, what, you, what you're saying, Christopher, is quite interesting and it does actually, there, there's a much wider debate there rather than um, IT. Um, as a country, we have the majority of our businesses, small micro businesses, um, and a lot of those original business owners are, are getting older and older. Um, and there's a danger those businesses will be lost. Um, I think it's particularly an issue in the West Midlands where you've got the car um, uh, manufacturing um, uh, happening that quite often, although you've got the likes of Jaguar Land Rover, which are big businesses, their supply chains come from very small local businesses and it's an ageing sort of business owner sector that there and when they close, all the knowledge and skills within that business are lost. Um, so it's something, you know, that, that organisations like Jaguar Land Rover are really keen that those businesses don't disappear. Families quite often don't want to now take on those businesses, whereas traditionally it would have been widget and sons. Sons no longer want to take over making widgets. Um, and so actually the ability to be able to pass it over to the, to the workers is a real opportunity our challenge is that that option is not widely known and I think how we encourage solicitors, accountants, all those types of people to say there's an option here, um, who do we talk to? Do we talk to the likes of um, the FSB or the Chambers of Commerce to let people know that that option is there? As you then said, 
the other challenge is enabling the workers to access the finance to make it happen. Obviously, there used to be Baxi um, who would help with some form of finance and people like Cooperative and Community Finance, you know, will support workers to do buyouts. But quite often they need more than that. Um, and I think, as a, you know, that's where we struggle as a country, but it should be something we should be looking to. Um, and I don't quite know how we change the mood music on that. But that issue around succession in small businesses is really, really important and a real opportunity for the movement that we haven't quite managed to, to work out how we can take it. You're on mute, Karen. Well, is, does that, is that OK, Christopher? Does that answer part of your question? Are you happy with that? Yes, that's that's fine. Uh, sharing the information and, and perhaps a slight follow up in, in a sense. And, and again, apologies, because it may have sort of been covered. Uh, it's always trying to see how people grow, thrive and develop. And I just think um, that there's a, another opportunity now which will come out of COP26 because I just think that there's going to be a massive shift towards environmentalism and everyone's going to re return to their business and think about their business. And I just wonder, you know, a lot of people say, you know what, it's too much work to think about this business, so I want out. So I just think there could be some opportunities. And also um, a number of people, as you have said, a lot of people getting older, so then they'll want out of their businesses. Um, and then I just wonder if, if it, cause it's so often, even even for Nick, he was saying, well, we couldn't because the legislation was slightly awkward. And I just wonder if having, a, 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 I think we've lost them, regional cooperative councils. And I don't mean a, a council in a geogra geographical sense, but a West Midlands council, a North Midlands, a, um, a Northern cooperative council that we used to have those all over the place. And we've got one in Wales, the Wales Cooperative Centre. It's not a council in that sense. And they, they would offer support and help. And I just wonder if that would be something that we should be either looking or is that a too backward looking? Is that a bit of a negative backward looking going backwards in my effort to go forward? Is that actually going backwards? I wonder how, how you'd feel about that. Yeah, I mean, I must be honest, I, I don't know much about the, the regional councils myself. Uh, it's probably a bit before my time in the co-op movement, so I, I honestly can answer about how helpful they would be. Um, I mean, again, I, I know it's, it is quite disappointing for us that we had to go down the limited uh, company route because of that legislation. Um, and it's actually quite frustrating now because there is, you know, I know in some circles of the movements, there is some snobbery towards um, co-ops that are set up as a limited company rather than a society. And it's not our fault. We were just trying to do the right thing at the time by being a worker co-op in any way we could. So again, any change to legislation that can support that, brilliant. But again, you know, how that manifests itself to to help, I just I couldn't I couldn't be on. I honestly couldn't say. I don't know whether Joe has better experiences with those regional councils or not. Or perhaps it's because I'm older than you, Nick. Maybe that's <laughs> where we should that. go with that. <laughs> um, in terms of the regional co-op councils, I mean, I was chair of the Southeast uh, Cooperative Southeast, the regional co-op council in in the southeast i think they they died a death when the um conservative government sort of did away with regions when there were regions we had the opportunity to talk to the rdas you know the regional co-op councils very much kind of mirrored um those sort of um administrative areas they're interesting enough there is still a co-op council in the west midlands um which is doing some work and um there was a meeting earlier this week and this sort of thing was up for discussion about how do we get the message out who are the people we need to be talking to to promote these these options um will they come back i i don't know is the answer uh, christopher i i don't know I would say even when they were there, the, the Welsh example is a really effective version. I think some of the English versions were, not for lack of trying, were less able to have an impact in the way that the Welsh one was. Is, did, does that answer the question or not? 
Yeah, I think that's perfectly fair. I mean, I don't know whether they'll come back or not, but that's why, again, you know, you know, I'd say all, all power to both uh, the counties and uh, cooperative futures for having this sort of a meeting, because the point is where or how do cooperatives or cooperators or people who are thinking cooperatively but don't even realise they're thinking cooperatively, where, where do they gather? How do they gather? I'm, I, I'm, I'm sort of not a person running a cooperative business, but I believe in cooperatives. So what do I do? You know, because I'm not running a business like, say, Nick. Do I just sort of say, well, good luck, Nick, all the best, mate, you know, and leave it at that? Or do I say, I want a world with mid-counties and Nick's business, you see what I mean, working because I want more co-ops. And then I look at COP26 and I know why I want more co-ops. Because their values and principles are going to get me closer to an environmentally aware approach than a capitalist set of businesses. So the public, less knowledgeable than me, are, are, are just say, well, I take what I'm given and I take what's out there. So I've got to, I'm thinking as a person who's, who's in, you know, informed, a little bit informed out there, I'm then trying to work out, well, how do I get more cooperative businesses? What is the problem? What is the need for them? So I applaud you for doing this sort of a meeting and gathering. But then I say, are there other places? Are there other trading posts where we can meet and gather? Or if there is a lack, is that what we need? And equally, I'm not one who's glued to the, future, uh, glued to the past. So if we don't want to go backwards, let's go forwards. But how do we go forwards? And, you know, so back again to applaud the mid-counties mid for trying to do something that gets the opportunity for people to gather and talk. But we've then got to work out how we take it further and wider. And, you know, I, I, the point I was about to follow up with a, a, a point, at least, that there's a lack of support for cooperatives. There's a lack of understanding about cooperatives and civil servants. You know, and I speak as a civil servant, but not in, in this area. I'm a civil servant in the magistrates' courts. So I work for the courts in that sense. But people in the in London and the economy have no interest and no understanding, almost, of cooperatives. So any time they're talked to about it, they, they, they'll say, "Well, you know, right, we're, we're we're not much interested." But I tell you what, we'll give a hundred million to it when there's billions going around everywhere else. We'll give a tiny amount to cooperatives. And we don't understand them. So that's really not, you know, it's the fringe of the economy. So we've got to educate the civil servants or we don't have a chance. And that goes, by the way, for Wales and Scotland. Wales needs their civil servants educating. So who's going to educate them? I can't expect it to be Nick's job. He's got to run his co-op. So we've got to have some other body or a large or mid counties or somebody playing that educating and informing and raising awareness role, it's got to be done. But I don't quite know who, and it can't be me, folks. I can only chip in. It's got to be someone, but not not just me. Makora Law, woo! You know, someone's got to do it. You're not wrong. Um, I, I'm not quite sure who can do it either. I think I think that's one of the challenges for the movement, isn't it? Is is where do we find these people? It's um, it, it's how do we stop talking to ourselves and start talking to other people? And I think that's always been one of our bigger challenges. So um, I, ju I just want to pick up Ed's put another question um, in the chat. Uh, modern legislation is for CBSs, that's community benefit societies. Does this make it easier to form worker co-ops? The legislation that was brought in um, that uh, made sort of made it easier for CBSs, community benefit societies, also created cooperative societies at the same time. Up until that point, um, there was only an industrial and provident society, um, which, as you can see, sort of mirrors the, the discussion around um, the Italian, uh, sorry, the international designation of industrial um, as, as worker co-ops. Um, so it did make setting up cooperative societies easier as well as community benefit societies. The challenge we've got is it's still much easier to set up a, a company um, and, you know, there are some some challenges there and, and, and cooperative companies are not wrong, um, but it's often difficult to get the message across, I think, sometimes. So... 
Brilliant. Thanks, Ed. That's obviously answered Ed's question. Well, if we haven't got any more questions at all, I just goes to say thank you to Joe, Kathy, and Nick for doing this with us tonight. Um, as I said, the, this has been recorded for anybody that turned up late, and we will get it onto our website um, within the next sort of few days, so you can catch up um, on what we've discussed. As I said, my uh, email address is in the chat, and if anybody um, has any questions after this, then you can drop me a line and I can forward them on to Joe. Um, Christopher just said, would you like the idea or, or concept of a cooperative Dragon's Den? What do you think, Clay? Do you, do you want to start a Dragon's Den type? Who gets to do the judging? That's what I want to know. <laughs> well, it only comes to say thank you guys. Thanks um, for everybody that's joined us this evening for taking your time out of your Wednesday evening. Um, we really appreciate it. And like I said at the beginning, do check out the other events that we're holding on our uh, events page on the website. Um, and thank you. Thanks everybody for attending and thanks guys for putting the session on in the first place. Thank you. Thanks Thank very you. much. Bye-bye. Thanks guys. Bye-bye.